Today we're going to look at really a second sermon in a little mini-series that I've titled Reach. This series grew out of a, uh, a few weeks we were spending just celebrating the gospel, explaining what the good news of Jesus Christ is, and really what we're supposed to do with it as children of God. And at the tail end of that, we really talked about sharing our faith. And here now, as we get ready for our Easter season, I thought it'd be a really good opportunity to encourage you to be people who have a deep faith in Christ and who want to share how wonderful that faith is with other people. So I'm going to be sharing with you this morning a sermon that I've titled, Sharing Hope This Easter Season. Sharing Hope This Easter Season. Um, if you have a Bible, why don't you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll begin there, Ephesians chapter 2. And we'll look at a few different passages of Scripture which talk about hope and the relationship we're supposed to have with hope as God's children. And so uh, with that in mind, let me uh, have a word of prayer and uh, then we'll look at our passage and I want to share with you three different aspects of the hope that we have as children of God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this opportunity and uh, Lord, thank you for each dear individual in this sanctuary today. Lord, thank you for the faith that is on display in their life simply by virtue of their presence in this sanctuary. God, I ask that you would speak to your children today, to every child of God in this room, Heavenly Father, would you speak to them today, touching their heart, Lord, challenging them, encouraging them, God, inspiring in them truly what is the great hope that we have in your Son, Jesus Christ. Would you speak now, God? That's our prayer, and we commit to listen in faith. We pray that in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Let me, uh, let me talk about hope this morning and really the kinds of hope that we have as children of God. Number one, we have hope for life. Hope for life, which is to say we have not just a hope that we get to experience one day when we die and go to heaven to be with the Lord. We have a hope for right now, a hope for life. Look at me at Ephesians chapter 2. I just want to read a couple of verses there to make this point. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 12 and 13. The, the reality is the hope we have as Christians is a hope that sometimes is easily taken for granted. And when we take things for granted, it's not very far from there to start forgetting those sorts of things. And so I want to take a moment just to remind you about the hope you have in Jesus Christ. So let me tell you about that hope here from Ephesians chapter 2. There in verse 12, the Apostle Paul, speaking to a group of Christians just like you, he says, remember, right? Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise. Those are all just really biblical theological ways of saying you were lost, you were not saved. And then notice the next phrase. He's wanting us to remember this in our lives. There was a point in your life, he says, where you had no hope and you were without God in the world. No hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. Will you just take a moment in your life right now and rehearse what it was like before you knew Jesus? Because the Bible says in that state, you had no hope and you were without God here in this world. And if that was a long time ago, it's again, easy to take that for granted and then from there to forget about that. Maybe that you became a Christian at a very early age and if that's the case, it's kind of hard for you to remember what it was like before you were a Christian because you know, the majority of your life you spent as a child of God. Well, let's just look at the reality described here before us in God's word. Before we knew Christ, we had no hope. But Jesus in his great mercy, in his great love, in that, in that just wonderfully hospitable, outward facing love that God has for us, we were saved. We were, we were let in on the one great hope in this life, the hope of Jesus Christ. And so as we think about hope for life, let me share with you just three reasons why we ought to have some hope today. There's a lot more reasons than this, but we don't have time for a sermon with 20 points today, okay? So let me just pick three and share with you some reasons why we have hope. Number one, we have hope because of forgiveness. 
We have been forgiven of our sins. The burdens of guilt, the crippling effect of unforgiveness and the seeming inability to stop or to practice self-control. But because Jesus died on the cross, there's hope. Because Jesus is now on the throne, no case is impossible. There is hope. Here's the way Paul described a little bit of this in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, again, speaking to Christians very much like us. He says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? So don't be deceived, neither. And then Paul's going to list here what uh, a New Testament commentators call a vice list. Just a list, not exhaustive, but a list of problems that church had experienced out of which they'd been saved. He says, listen, those, these kind of people do not inherit the kingdom of God. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's a pretty bad list, right? Some of y'all look at that and you say, man, I'm glad I'm not one of those things. Well, here's what God's word says next. And such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I think Paul, both in Ephesians where we started here now in 1 Corinthians, he really takes pains to let God's people know, be careful you don't forget where you came from. You have hope now because of forgiveness. We have hope in this life because of forgiveness. So when was the last time that you experienced meaningful forgiveness? When, when was the last occasion in your life that you remember feeling a very deep sense of sin and, and conviction, which is to say the feelings we experience when the Holy Spirit comes near to us and exposes that, hey, there is sin in your life. And then brought to a place of humility, we say, God, I have been awa made aware of my sin. I am sorry. Would you please forgive me? And then, and then when in faith we ask that, we know what that forgiveness feels like. When was the last time? Because I'm going to tell you, the hope that you carry as a child of God, it's attached to that forgiveness. And the second reason that we have hope for life, and that's we have hope because of a father. Right? The Bible doesn't just say we're forgiven and then sent on our way. No, the Bible teaches that when we're forgiven, God in his great love for us actually adopts us into his family and claims us as one of his own. Reading here later in this same chapter, Ephesians chapter 2, down in verse number 18 and 19, here's the way Paul describes our salvation. He says, for through him, that is through Christ, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. That's the language. Not just the Almighty, not just Jehovah, not just God most powerful, but to the Father. And so then, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. Listen, we have hope in this life because our God is a Father to us who loves us, who knows us, who provides for us, and who welcomes us into his household. Listen to how the author of Ephesians talks about God's uh, perspective on us as members of his family. Uh, Hebrews 11, verse 16, the writer there says, as it is, they desire a better country, speaking of believers, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, notice this, God is not ashamed to be called their God because he has prepared for them a city. God's not ashamed to be called your God. Now listen, I've done some things that in my opinion, he probably should be ashamed of. And you probably have too. There are things maybe in your life you've done, you say, I still feel shame for that wrong, for that sin, for that selfish act, for that thing which I knew was wrong. I saw it coming. I did not take precautions. I was faced with it. I gave in and then I felt conviction 
for that sin. Let me tell you something. Because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you, you've been adopted into a family. God is now your father. And here's the word God wants you to hear today. You might feel shame over that, but God's not ashamed. And here's why. Because it's been paid for by the blood of Christ. If you're here this morning and you're carrying shame in your life, and you'd say, you'd say at one and the same time, I know I'm a child of God and I carry shame for my sins. Give that shame to Jesus and be embraced by a loving Father who, who God's Word says is not ashamed to be called your God. Everything about you that was shameful has been nailed to the cross where Jesus paid to rid you of your shame. Everything about Jesus that would lead the Father to say, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, is now true about you as well in Christ. What's true of Jesus is true of you in the sense that he, you too are beloved sons and daughters in Christ in whom the Father is pleased to say, this is my son and this is my daughter. We have hope because we have a father. One other reason that we can celebrate our hope today, our hope for life, and we have hope because of a future. The Bible speaks in so many wonderful ways about the benefits of being a child of God. Notice what Romans chapter uh, 5 says, Romans 5 verse 3 and following. It says, not only that, but we can rejoice in our sufferings. Right? The good is good. Even the bad can be good when God uses it for good because we know suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. And here comes our word. And character produces hope. And here's what God says about our hope. A hope that does not put us to shame. It is a hope in which we can be confident the hope that God gives to every one of his children. Now, his point here is not merely to say that, hey, your future is a hope-filled future. Really, his, his more immediate point is, as you think about the certainty of your future, right, bring that to bear and let it help you endure in the present when you go through difficulties because you do have a hope and the hope is true. The hope will come to fruition, Difficulties in this life can be endured when there is hope and we have hope for life as children of God. Let me share with you a second hope that we have, right? We're, we're trying to share hope this Easter season. There's hope for life. Now, let's, uh, let's look at a, another side of the doctrine of hope. We have hope for death also. Now, I'm not going to try to get too morbid with you today. I think a lot of us are in good spirits. I don't want to kill the mood. But... The Bible says there's even hope for the most desperate of situations any of us will ever face, and that is our own demise or our own death. Uh, if you have a Bible, turn with me to another passage. We're going to read a few verses now in uh, 1 Thessalonians. Would you turn there with me? 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. We've looked just barely scratching the surface at the subject of hope for life. Now we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that really shares with us the hope we have as we think about death. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, let's look at verse 13 down through verse 18. Here's what the Apostle Paul says. He's, he's speaking to these believers about the subject of death. And he says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep. Right? That's a euphemistic way of referring to death. So that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. So God tells us here, listen, yeah, death is a pretty scary thing for everybody, believer and unbeliever, but we have hope. And so that hope should inform us and inspire us as we think about or as we grieve the death of another person. Verse 14, he says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, in the same way, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Again, this is another nice way of referring to a very not nice thing, which is death, that language of falling asleep. For we say this to you, verse 15, by a word from the Lord, we who are still alive at the Lord's coming, we will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, 
and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are still alive, we who are left will be caught up together with them in the air, uh, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll always be with the Lord. Therefore, all right, there's a lot there. We're not going to unpack all of it. Paul's talked about uh, death there. He's talked about what happens to our loved ones when they die. He's talked about Jesus coming back again, right? The second coming of Christ. And now he's talked about what will happen to our loved ones who have died when Jesus returns and what will happen to us if we happen to still be living when Jesus returns. What will happen? And here's his conclusion. Look at verse 18. Having thought about all those things, he says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, that's a strange thing to say. Essentially, uh, Paul just said, listen, lots of people are going to die. It's going to be hard. Therefore, encourage one another with these words, <laughs> right? His point here is this. Even when we look at death, if we understand what God has promised us, if we look at what Jesus has already done, and we look at the promises regarding what he's telling us he's still yet going to do. We are not without hope, even as we think of really what would be the most hopeless of situations, death. No, we have hope. So, so what is our hope for death? Let me note just a couple of things. Number one, just sort of uh, extrapolating from these verses, a few truths we can consider together. Death is not the end. That's what, that's what God's word teaches here. Death feels so final to us because it seems to be the end of all we've ever known and experienced. But God's word tells us death is not the end. When you die, there is another chapter. There's still yet more. And therefore, Christians look at death differently. The Bible teaches that at the moment of death for the child of God, there is instant entrance into heaven. Now, in what way exactly does that transpire, right? What, do we go in this body? I don't think so. There's a future resurrection to come regarding this body. Will we have some sort of temporary body while we're there? I'm not really sure. Maybe. Uh, the apostle Paul had a vision he talks about in some of his letters where he went up to a certain place in heaven and he acts kind of like he had a body, but we, we, we're not really sure how all that works. But here's what we do know. When we die, it's not over. The machine doesn't just get turned off and then darkness. We continue to live. Jesus told the thief on the cross beside him, who in, in, in the quintessential deathbed conversion had just told Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you are coming into your kingdom. Jesus looked at this man and said, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Like immediately you will be with me in paradise. Paul would say elsewhere, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And so there's hope for us, even as we think about death. Death is not the end. In a, in a powerful passage about death and faith and resurrection, the passage in which Jesus would resurrect Lazarus from the dead. Notice this conversation in John 11. John 11, verse 23 as a starting point, Jesus said to her, the her being one of Lazarus' sisters, right? Lazarus and his family, they were all close with Jesus. Jesus knew them all very well. Lazarus has passed away. Jesus arrives at the scene to offer comfort to the family. There's some, something of a funeral type of thing going on. And Jesus says to the sister, your brother will rise again. Martha, the sister, said to Jesus, well, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And so she brings up the resurrection. She brings up the resur this, this doctrine that teaches, hey, when God's making all things right, sort of bringing a close to all that he'd done in heaven and earth up to that point, when that happens, there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. And so there's a lot of hope here being placed in this doctrine of the resurrection. Notice what Jesus said. Right? She says, well, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. Right? That's where your hope is. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. He looked at this sister and he said, do you believe this? 
And she gave a great answer, which basically meant, yes, I do. And we do too. Death is not the end. A couple other things we can say about death. Death has been defeated. The Bible teaches not only that, that we continue to live, but death itself, our literally our mortal enemy, death has been defeated. In 1 Corinthians 15, you know, as I put this sermon together, I, I, it, it occurred to me, Paul thought a lot about death. It was important, and it happens to be one of the most significant features of our faith is that Jesus confronted death, our greatest enemy, surrendered himself to it on, on our behalf so that he could defeat it forever for us. Death is not the end, and death has been defeated. In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 54 and following, Paul would say this, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, he's speaking of a future resurrection, and then shall come to pass this saying, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's good. That's good. And then notice how he concludes that. He says, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. Right? He's encouraging. He's telling them we have hope. Not just for life, but also for death. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The debt has been paid. Jesus paid it. The curse has been lifted because Jesus bore it. The brokenness has been set in a process of restoration, and Jesus is repairing it. There is victory, victory. Uh, it, it may feel as you're going through something in life that's really, really hard, maybe the death of a loved one. I mean, I think it's about the most difficult thing many of us will ever endure. As we endure that, it may be difficult to, to just imagine how this is a victory. How have we defeated death? And yet people still die. Well, imagine with me a scene from like, like a world war, like just some awful scene of devastation, years of fighting, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of soldiers killed, civilizations ransacked and burned and devastated. And picture this scene with soldiers in foxholes, bloodied, dirty, hopeless, surrounded by rubble, and someone brings to them news, the war is over. The war is over. The enemy has been defeated. Now, they're still bloodied. They're still grieving over all of their brothers in arms who have lost their lives. They're still a long way from home. But they start celebrating because the war is over. The enemy has been defeated. That is our perspective on death. Death has been defeated. One other thing I'll say about death is we think about hope even for death. Death has been reversed in Christ. It's been defeated, sure, but it's actually been reversed, right? Dying takes us to our demise, and coming back to life puts that process in reverse. Jesus didn't just die to secure the victory. In his death, he paid the price. There was a victory, but three days later, he showed up, not dead, but alive, having stolen life from death. From the moment that Adam and Eve first sinned in the world, everything affected as it has been by sin and brokenness has been locked in really the curse of a downward spiral, the slippery slope of sin and brokenness, and it has spiraled out of control. But then when Jesus died for our sins and rose again in victory, everything changed. Everything changed. The trajectory of our world's condition was changed. 
as Jesus fulfilled and set in motion all of the promises of God. And this is our hope. It's a hope for life. It's a hope for death. And let me share with you one final point this morning. It's a hope for others. It's not just a hope for us. It's also a hope for others. So I hope this morning that some scripture that's been read, some picture that's been described has touched your heart, has excited you, has encouraged you. And now I hope you'll change gears and take the next step and say, I want to give that to someone else. This wonderful hope which we have in Jesus Christ. The last passage I want to look at this morning comes from 1 Peter. If you want to turn there with me, 1 Peter chapter 3. And uh, we'll look at just a few verses there. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. And as I read this, I want to ask the question, what will we need if we're going to share hope with other people? I've been encouraging the last couple of weeks to really invite folks to church, to share the gospel with other people. What is it we need in order to do those things? I think 1 Peter 3 tells us. 1 Peter 3, verse 14 and 15, God's word says this, but... Even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear them or be intimidated. This, this, this them meaning unbelievers before whom you may be called to share your faith. He says, don't, be, don't fear them or be intimidated, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you, right? The hope, that's what we're talking about today. There should be a hope inside of you. You should be ready to give people a defense and a reason for that hope if you have the chance to share with them about it. And yet, he says in verse 16, important caveat, do this with gentleness and reverence keeping a clear conscience so that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. We have a hope to offer other people. What will we need to share that hope? Number one, we need courage to share. Courage. You need courage to share with other people. He says, don't be afraid of them, right? You need courage. Don't be afraid of them. And I think the courage we need manifests itself in two ways. Number one, uh, negatively, we need not to be afraid. Positively, we need to regard Christ as holy in our hearts, right? There's, There's a negative and a positive aspect to our courage. This is to say we need to have a bigger yes than whatever the fear and the no is. Right? If, if we love Jesus, if we know him deeply enough, that motivation will outweigh whatever negative feelings we have because of a fear. We need courage to share. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, I think my greatest fear in this world is sharks. I don't like swimming in the ocean. If I'm in the ocean up to my ankles, I'm standing there thinking, what was that? What was that? And I, I hear the strings of that Jaws theme song. I blame this on being exposed to that movie at way too young of an age. I'm pretty sure I watched that movie a few times through before I was in grade school. And so uh, I'm very, very scared of sharks. So that's a big no from me. But if, uh, if we're on a boat and one of my children falls in the water, I don't care if there's a hundred sharks swimming around, daddy's going in to get them. They're probably going to eat both of us, but I'll die trying. (laughs) Because my yes to my children is bigger than my no to the sharks. You understand? That's what we need to share Jesus. A bigger yes to Jesus than the no of fear. We need a courage to share. Not only that, we need conviction to share. Conviction to share. Notice in uh, verse 15, in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope is it that's in you. Now, there's an assumption in this verse that I'm not sure always gets pointed out. The assumption is that you're living in such a way that from time to time people are going to notice and ask, hey, what's up with you? Why are you so different? When was, when was the last time someone came to you and said, you know, I've noticed you're just different. Like when you go through trials, there's a hope in your life other people don't have. 
Where do you get your confidence from? Where do you get your peace from? Why is there joy in your life to a greater degree than in everyone else's life? Here's the problem. I think for many of us, it's been a while since someone noticed and asked us about it. Let's live in such a way that our yes to Christ is so big that people notice. That's what I mean when I talk about a conviction to share. We need a hope that is observable. We need a hope that is compelling. And we need a reasonable faith. Peter says, be ready to give a reason, right? A defense. These are words which simply mean be ready to talk about the difference that Jesus has made in your life. Finally, we need character to share. We need courage. We need conviction. We also need character to share. Notice he says in verse 16, yet do this with gentleness and reverence. Right? He's talking about your posture, your attitude, how you treat other people. And he says keeping a clear conscience so that when you're accused, those who disparage your, notice, good conduct. Again, there's some assumptions being made in this passage. The assumptions are if you're a child of God, you treat people well. Gentleness and reverence toward other persons. If you're a child of God, you've got a clean conscience. Christ has forgiven you. The Spirit has uh, empowered you. And you're trying to live a holy life before others. And there's good conduct. And so I, I, I summarize the, the advice we have here on our character this way. Be kind, be real, and behave. Be kind. In other words, don't be a jerk. That's a little harsh there. It's hard to share faith with someone when you've been a jerk to them or in front of them. I mean, it's just really hard. So don't do that. Be real, right? A clear conscience means you're authentic. Don't be a hypocrite. Be real. And then behave. Don't ruin your testimony. Because people are watching. People are watching and they don't even know they're watching. They just know you. Right? Let's not just be churchgoers. Like people know that about us. Our neighbors see we get up on Sunday mornings and put on a nice outfit and come to church. Our family knows that. Let's be more than that. Let's be children of God who have a, a, a huge yes to Jesus so that we can share his hope with other people. Here's how I want to close our message this morning. I want to ask the question, do you have the hope of Christ in your life? Do you have the hope of Jesus Christ in your life? If you do, I want to challenge you today. Share that hope with other people. Pray for other people that they would have that hope as well and that God would use you in the sharing of that hope uh, in, in a moment, we're going to pray, and uh, I believe we're going to sing another song together here at the end. Um, but I want to remind you about these little invite cards. How many of you, by show, how many of you grabbed one of these cards last week? I know a lot of you did because we ran out. Good, good. Well, we have more. Even if you're here this morning and you're thinking, I don't even know who I'd give it, one, give it to. Grab one. Just grab one. You never know. You're at Walmart in the checkout line. Hand it to the person that helps you. You're at a restaurant, you leave a tip. Remember, don't be a jerk. Leave a good tip. Lay that little invite card down there with your tip. It, it simply says, come to church with me this weekend. It has our church information and a link where they can go online and learn some more. I want to give you one more tool that you can use to share. If you look at the screens, we, um, we want to encourage you to share this post, right? It's the same thing, same thing that you see, right? Uh, many of you are on Facebook. If you're not, hey, that's totally fine. Grab one of these cards. But if you are... We've made this little post, and it's got everything they need to know. And if you'll just click the little share button, then um, it'll bring up a little, a little uh, dialog box that says share now. If you'll click that, basically what that's doing is that's giving this card digitally to all the friends that you're friends with there on Facebook. So I'm guessing if you'll share that, there'll be somebody who sees it who lives, you know, within a relative distance here to First Baptist Rinkin, and they may not come next Sunday, they may not come the next Sunday, but I promise you when something happens in their life and they think, you know, maybe I should go to church, they're going to think of the place that invited them. 
They're going to think of the person who invited them. So we're giving you a card to hand out today, and we've got a nice little post on our FBC Rinkin Facebook page that you can share. So I want to challenge you to hand these cards out and to share that post on Facebook, okay? Uh, matter of fact, that's something you could do right now. You could even take your phone out before we get done with our service and share that post. Let me invite you to bow with me. We're going to um, have a time of reflection and uh, a time of worship as we close out our service. As we do that, while your heads are bowed, would you just ask Lord, the Lord to touch your heart and um, ask the Lord to help you be the kind of person that has a really big yes to Jesus so that you can share hope with other people. Father in heaven, we just ask that you'd take these next few moments. And God, that you'd do a work in our hearts. We've heard from your word. Lord, we have worshiped together. I believe your Holy Spirit, God, has been in this room touching people's hearts. In these next few moments, as we have an opportunity to respond, we pray, God, everything you ask of us, we would say yes. We would say yes. And God, if there's one person here today who does not have the hope of Jesus Christ, I pray that you'd touch their heart right now. Touch their heart, Jesus. Jesus, would you offer them hope? right now say yes to him say yes to him father we pray these things in the name of christ our great hope we pray that in his name amen